So before we get into the business, just briefly tell these people your story, how you got here and how you got to Chobani. You know, um, somebody said it uh, once, Mr. President, says, um, I came to upstate, yada, 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 it became this. You know, it's, it's, it's a short story, but it's a long story. But what I can tell you is it's been an amazing journey. I came here in end of 94 uh, to learn English, to go to school. And I left when I, when I took my mother's permission to come, I promised her I would go back after four years, which um, I couldn't keep that promise. Um, but when I moved to upstate New York, I, I lived in New York, New York City for a little bit. When I moved to upstate New York in a small town, I said, my God, this is like my home. So I immediately felt home in upstate New York and worked in a farm uh, for a couple of years while I was going to SUNY Albany to learn English. Um, you know, I am Kurdish from Turkey. I grew up watching my family making cheese and yogurt, you know, herding sheep and cows. So I come from a farming background. That's why upstate felt like a home. My father said, you should start making cheese. I laughed first and then I, I did his, um, because I said I didn't travel this thousand miles to come here to make exactly what I was making home, so why would I do that? But he said, there's no good cheese here, you should do it. And, and I did. Um, and then later on, I saw an ad that said, fully equipped yogurt plant for sale. It was evening in my office. I didn't pay attention much, but later on I picked it up, called the number, and I went to the place. And it turns out it's a craft that's closing a plant after about 75, 80 years in a community. And what they were asking was not too much, and I bought it uh, with an SBA loan, which uh, you made it very easy, your, your term, for us to be able to apply that kind of loans. When I got the loan and bought the plant, I hired five people from that 55 employees that they were let go. And the first board meeting was four factory workers, myself, around the table. This is August of 9, 2005. And they said, what are we going to do now? I said, well, I'm looking at outside the, 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 the walls of the plant. They seem old. We should paint it. We should go to the ACE and get some white paints and we should paint it. And I'll never forget Mike, one of the uh, maintenance guy, and he said, tell me you have better ideas than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. And, <laughs> and I, I, I think what I go back is, it's a town that lost the factory. People never felt this low. And they never thought there would be another beginning of this because the factory was old and one of the largest companies was leaving. Here I was, you know, with a little bit of English, with five factory workers, we were painting the walls outside all summer of 2005 without knowing what we were going to do next. But in the work of painting, we learned what to do with those five people. And fast forward, 2007, we launched Chobani. By 2012, we were over a billion dollars in sales. We had over 2,000 people employed. Um, you know, we, I built a plant in Idaho, you know, one of the largest yogurt plants in the world. During this time, unemployment rate went from 8.5 in upstate New York to almost 5 now, over 8.5 in Twin Falls, Idaho to 3% today. And in early days, I went to Utica to the refugee center, and I said, I'd like to hire these people. And I have 11 different nationalities in Chabani factories. We have translators. And with the 30% refugees settled in Idaho, Twin Falls, Idaho, and upstate New York, with the local residents in Twin Falls, Idaho, and upstate New York, you know, we became a community. And we became a family. And every single one of them has sweat and, and, and hard work into this success. So you say they're from 11 different nationalities. So 
What got you so committed to dealing with the Syrian crisis and to pledge so much money to deal with it? I, um, I saw this, this, what I did with the um, working with the refugees is, is like five years ago, we started doing this. So I saw with my own eyes what happens when a person settles in Utica and the, the minute they get a job, that's the minute they stop being a refugee. That's the minute they stand on their own feet, they can build their life for themselves. And I also saw my own eyes, like how is someone from Nepal or someone from Africa, someone from, you know, uh, Myanmar, whatever they come from, while making the cup of yogurt, how they become a friends and family and be part of that. So being from the region and seeing what happened to Yazidi community in the Sinjar Mountains when they were attacked and all those girls were um, kidnapped, I saw the picture on New York Times and I just, I just thought that mother was calling on me and I had to do something. And, and start working and going to UNHCR and IRC, find out that even though I was involved with this, but I didn't know the depth of this. Just like you said, there are 60 million people out there, displaced or refugees. Um, they are in the camps. Some of them, they live in 15, 17 years. Um, and the way that we are handling all this refugee crisis, which is the biggest since World War II, uh, is with the conditions of World War II in 1940s and 50s. I went to Lesbos, for example, and I look at how people are coming from the journey from Turkey to that island, which is some of them die. We saw some pictures. With there, with my business mind, I said, well, I could do this this way. I could get the hotels to do this. I could get the restaurants to do this. I can do register better. So we need to bring the, the business and innovation into this right away now uh, while all these amazing organizations are, you know, um, uh, handling it. So we, we, I, f I found a tent and start doing the research because I saw the lack of research out there. And I start doing the studies of what is the refugees' economic impact in the community. So that studies keep going on. And I also asked my friends in the community, businesses, to come and, come and join. So we created 10 pledge. And honored to say that we have about over 12 companies like MasterCards, and UPS, you know, Airbnb, IKEA, uh, Western Union, Henry Shine, like list goes on the companies that care about this issue is joining the 10 pledge. And so we're hoping with this room, there are a lot of good CEOs that cares about this and coming to this uh, biggest humanitarian crisis and, and, and help the government, help the NGOs, but we cannot leave this only to the governments and NGOs. We have to bring business minds and innovators into this. You know, um, we were talking about this backstage, but a young, man who comes from an immigrant family who used to work with us is now working with the IRC in Turkey. And he told me that they filmed several thousand Syrians as they came into Turkey. The Turkey, as you probably know, has by far the largest number of Syrian refugees. There are more than two million there. Although tiny Lebanon has about a million and Jordan has 600 and 50,000 or so, plus a lot of Egyptians and others. So they're the most, those two small countries probably are under the most stress. But he asked people, literally coming off the boat and filmed them, hundreds and hundreds of them, what were you doing before you left your home? And they were overwhelmingly small business people, workers, and not a small number of professionals. And I think it's important that I know what caused all the fear and reluctance. It was Paris, because 6,000 people went from Europe to ISIS land. About 1,500 came home. If 1% of them was radicalized and sort of sneaked back in with evil intentions, that's about how many people it took to kill all those people in Paris. So people are thinking like that. But the tradition of the Syrians 
is amazing in America. Most Syrians live, or the largest Syrian settlements are in Cleveland and Dearborn, Michigan. And if you went up there and said something bad about them, you could get in a fight, not with a Syrian, with someone who's Irish or African American or Hispanic or Polish because they are such a part of the community. They have made such amazing contributions. And I think your vouching for that is important because the truth is the big loser in this over the long run is going to be Syria. This is an enormous opportunity for Americans. Detroit has 10,000 empty, structurally sound houses. 10,000. And a lot of jobs to be had repairing those houses. But Detroit just came out of bankruptcy and the mayor's trying to do an innovative sort of urban homesteading program there. But it, it just gives you an example of what could be done. And I think any of us who've ever had any personal experience with either Syrian Americans or Syrian refugees think it's a pretty good deal. Do you have any idea just generally how many you think America should take and how many we could take? Uh, you know, I, I listened to Madam Albright the other day, you know, uh, actually on the first CGI. She, she, she said, you know, we're not doing enough. And, and I was in Germany just after that was, you know, looking at Hamburg. Hamburg took almost 90,000 refugees. And I was with the mayor, you know, two days. We, we looked at the uh, refugee centers, what they did. They were prepared to take five, 600, you know, that's what they were doing for years. Now they took 90,000. Um, you know, I, I think one thing is extremely important to, in my observation, is important to point out. The integration has to happen in both ways. And this message needs to be given to the people who's coming to the, to the you know, communities as well. Because from my experience, I was successful if I am, is because I felt home and upstate. One of the most important thing is, somehow it comes from my family, I guess, is I was very curious about people. I was very curious about the, the community. And I got to enjoy and seeing all these cultures that developed in those communities. So early on, I didn't come with that mindset of I am different. I came with a mindset of, of course, I come from a different place, but this is so similar to what I have been seeing. Because if you look at it from that eyes, you'll see a lot of similarities. So there is a message to the uh, community who's coming to the Germany, America, or wherever, is with that eyes of, yes, people are gonna welcome you, but you also have to welcome and respect where you're coming to. The first thing I enjoyed, which I've never that, I'm just, it's a funny story. We, put, we printed in Chobani Cup the day one, we said, if we are successful, 10% of our profit is gonna go to the community first, this community. And the first project we ever done was a Little League baseball field. Now, I have never been a baseball game ever before in my life. And I frankly don't get it anyway, but that's, <laughs> that's, but I saw how people are enjoying it. So we built this most beautiful Little League field in Norwich, New York. Cooperstown is about 45 miles, 45 minutes from there. And I said, I want this field to be as good as one in Cooperstown. And we built it, and we had an opening night on 4th of July. I put my baseball uh, uniform on, and there were kids in there. And I did the first pitch. It was my first ever pitch in my life. <laughs> and the kids were asking me to sign their uniform, Mr. President. And, and that was early on on, on Chobani's journey. That was the first project we've ever done. I would say one of the best moments in my life as seeing those kids are lined up and asking me to sign their, their uniform. I felt like I was one with that community. And that community was gonna do anything for me and I was gonna do anything for them. And we were one. It's extremely important to be part of that. Thanksgiving, I started enjoying Thanksgiving like second year I was here because a Portuguese immigrant family invited me to their homes and I got to learn why this has been done, what's the, what's the culture behind it. And then from that moment on at Chobani family, every, every Thanksgiving, we really enjoyed Thanksgiving. What I'm trying to say 
is we come from the different culture of a different place into another place. And the beauty is how can I harmonize what I bring with what's so special here? Because America, a very, very special place. It did that specialness, that magic to me. I built my dream. And I, from that eye, the, the, the background I had from my family, from my father, what I learned from my mother, how we make yogurt, you know, all that stuff, that was a seed and it was planted in upstate New York and became a tree. This could happen in everywhere as long as the integration happens in both ways. So I, I say this a lot. Now, how many people should come? That's, you know, decisions to be made in, in a higher level. But what we can do is the minute they're here, they decide it. I'll do everything I can to make sure that those people will have the same dream as I did and be part of the community, create jobs, bring the innovations, and bring flavors to the community, just like in South Edmonton and Twin Falls. Um, Turkey, for example, brought you know, close to two million people. And I'm proud what people of Turkey and, and, and what uh, you know, people in the government is trying to do in this issue. You know, it's huge. Like Jordan, 30% of the people that come to Jordan are refugees. Lebanon, almost half. Um, it's the biggest humanitarian crisis. These people are terrorized. That's why they're leaving their homes. And we are in a test. This test is either humanity is going to fail or it's going to fast. And I'm worried because we cannot fail this test, this test, because if we fail, the humanity is going to go to different uh, corners. We're going to be divided. And even if we advance in all the technologies that we're doing today, if we leave mass majority of the world behind, and if we don't show our care and our humanitarian side, I don't think it's going to be a good future for our kids. So we have an obligation for our kids and our, our future that what happened in 1940s and 50s in Europe does not happen again. Because today's generations are asking their parents, why didn't you do it enough? And, and, and with this test, our gen you know, future generations are going to ask the same question. Why did you let people die in the water? Why didn't you turn them away? Why didn't you let them to be terrorized? And I'd like to do my part, and I know a lot of people in this world that I'm, I'm seeing and I'm meeting and I'm talking, that they care and they want to do something. And I, I strongly believe that the business community, the CEOs, the modern you know, uh, innovators, we gotta, we got to crack this. Just like I go back to the w painting the walls, we were five people, it was an old factory, and we were very down, but we worked hard in five years. We look back now, we said that was one of the best things ever happened to that town, that factory being closed, now we built better. And just like you said in your early remarks, it's an opportunity to make the humanitarian closer and get it to the better place. Thank you. Um, just to support what you're saying, I, n I noted the other day, the Turks have done a really admirable job of taking in all these refugees. And in eastern Turkey, with the entry point for most of them, they have still the more or less permanent refugee camp now with a couple hundred thousand people there, as well as moving them on through. But there are two million in the country as a whole. But they built these pods of pretty good physical facilities and groups of basically gathering 10,000 people trying to sort of create a small town. Not so big people feel like they're anonymous, but big enough so that something could happen. And I saw an article the other day that said, in the last two years, 24% of all the new businesses started in Turkey were started by Syrian refugees. I mean, these people are incredibly gifted and very hardworking. So, there's a town actually in eastern part of Turkey, it's called Kilis. 60% of the whole town is refugees. I mean, this all happened in the last three, four years. Now you said, it, when you set up your tent foundation, you gave grants to various groups who were providing a variety of services in this area. And then you got all these business partners. Uh, just tell them again, 
as many of your partners as come off the top of your head because I have a very specific question about it. Like, you know, I don't know if Brian is here, but what Airbnb is doing is providing housing for the aid workers in the field for them to be able to find a house that they can do their job. So it's amazing what MasterCard is doing, coming up in a humane way of uh, doing a uh, you know, debit card instead of handing out cash. Th that's the way to do, to do it. I love what LinkedIn did in, you know, started a project in, um, in, in Sweden where connecting a refugee with, with the work, uh, which, is, which is an early on, but it's, it's, it's really amazing what, what can be done there. Um, you know, there are, there are things that, like, like what they do, but here's, here's how we can help. We can use our expertise and take risk to bring new technologies into these all touching points. Because it starts from a crisis, where the crisis starts, then to the new country, then there's a refugee camp, then they're in the move, or they're coming to the, another island, or to Europe, or whatever. All these touching points, there are innovations that can come in, either on the issue of women, or kids, or education, or registration, or if it's in the camp, you know, there are camps out there, people living there in 15, 17 years in these camps. Imagine if you're living in a camp for 17 years and you have no hope to get out, what kind of mindset you will have. We need to connect those with the rest of the world. I mean, I mean there are a lot, and then if, it, if they come to the new community, how they get integrated into the work. So there are touching points that we can do in every single one. So we have to use expertise and take risk and innovate on these, number one. Two, what we can do is we can give money. You know, UNHCR is underfunded. World Food Program is underfunded. It's good to see $10 billion you know, just raised in England, which is really, in London, which is really, really good. But if you look at the magnitude of the issue and the funding, is a huge gap. We can come in. We can, we can provide cash. It's badly needed. The third thing we can do is, you know, I go back to that Yazidi community, Mr. President, because I met one the other day, you know, a couple of weeks ago. She made it out. She was a teenager, 16, 17 years old. And she was kidnapped, and she went through all these horrible things, and, and one Arab family helped her out to get escape, and she made it home to um, northern Iraq, and after that she came to Germany. And she, have, she was here talking to the UN Security Council. And I had one-on-one -on -one with a few people and her talking. I was watching her, and I can see she's in dark. She just, she's just blocked. She's, she's, she's not there. And I asked her two questions. I asked her questions, but there are two times she smiled. One was, I said, how was the mountains behind your village? Because I know there are Sinjar mountains. And when I asked her that question, she smiled, and she started telling me how she would go up into the mountains and pick up flowers, and she was back to life. And the second time she smiled when I said, you know, me and so many others, we care about you, and we're trying to help people that who got hurt, but also we're trying so hard that this never happens again. And when she heard that, she smiled again. There's two signs. We can give hope. We can, we can make Nadia, after going through these horrible, horrible things happen to her, which it was not her fault. It was a shortcoming of us of responsible ones that she paid the price. We can give hope to Nadia and like people like Nadia to come back to life. And that, I think, is the most important thing that individuals like us can do. So that's the one that if I can get light at the smiles, more smiles than Nadia, I think we are successful. Let me ask you two other questions and we gotta wrap up. Um, when you hired these immigrants, how did the people in your workforce react? Were they for it from the beginning? Did it take a while to work out? There are a lot of people out here who might be able to hire some people. Now, that's my follow-up question, but just tell us how your own workers reacted to the 
infusion of new immigrants? I, I, I love that you asked that question because if you go to South Edmonton, in New York, most humble people, but they haven't seen, I was the first, someone from Turkey, the first time they met. Um, they, they met first time from someone from Nepal or from Ethiopia or from Iraq or from Syria. In my own eyes, I saw a family created. We are a welcoming community up there in America, even in Idaho, same thing. I have a Chobani, um, uh, a, like a council, which about 40 people in the factory that we all get together and we talk about what are things we should do. One of the first things they said is we need to get translators into the plant. I said, really, why? He says, well, we can't communicate. We want to know more, and we want them to know more. And so we end up hiring 11 different uh, translators into the factory because the, the local workers want us to do that. Um, not one single incident ever. If we, if we go to every summer, we do our um, Chobani picnic, and you should see it's United Nations in there. And, and it is the most beautiful thing to see. And it all happened because everybody's trying to make a cup of yogurt. And while we're making a cup of yogurt, we're building lives, we're building relationships and friendships, and we find the similarities in each other, not the differences. And that's why I say, if they come to the workplace, and if they work together, while they're building their, 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 uh, their life, they built all the community. One, one little example, one of the ladies, I think she's from Nepal, her daughter got into Yale. This is a first generation refugee. She, she had a lot of troubles happen. She lost her some family members. Her daughter, after five years, got into Yale. And she had a Yale t-shirt, her daughter, and the mother had a Chobani t-shirt. <laughs> and, and they were competing with t-shirt look better. And I have a picture with her in my, and everybody in the plant, they give her a, a party. This was like success of not only her daughter, it was a success of the whole factory and the whole community. Um, no doubt, I don't, I lived there, I, I lived in Twin Falls, Idaho, I lived in up this, upstate New York, and I see it in my own eyes. The depthness of the humanitarian side of the Americans are way bigger than anybody will say. All we need to do is act upon it because this country is special. The people are extremely special. I don't know how it's been built, but it's been built this way. And it made me to be part of it. And it would be the saddest thing to see it's damaged. Most of the people out here um, who might like to help are with businesses or nonprofits that have fewer employees than Chomani does. And therefore probably say, well, we could hire two or three or five. How do they get there? Suppose you made a sale out here and they really would like to do it. Uh, how hard is it to hire one family and make sure they're resettled? And is it just as hard to do one as it is to do 100? And if so, how can all these people who have clearly been impressed by you and your experience participate in this if they can't hire as many people as you can? One of the things I learned, which is funny, but I, I thought that was so interesting, is when the refugee is accepted by U.S. and coming to the wherever they, they're settling, the plane tickets is a loan. So basically they say, you need to pay this back to us. So you better go and find a job and work. So basically when they come, they have a right to work immediately. The question is, how fast can they find a job, work? I had one challenge, two challenges. I went to the refugee center in Utica. There are organizations that they settled. You know, you go to Nashville, you're, you know, Utica or Binghamton, or there are places that, that they come. And there are amazing people are trying to find them jobs. They knock doors, they field applications, they, they go to different places. But if you go to proactively and say, okay, what are the challenges? I had two. One, they couldn't travel from Utica to South Edmonton, so we put a, uh, cars, you know, we put some buses. It's no big deal. The second one is language. 
you can overcome by translation or English as a second language type of things. Um, these, these obstacles are not big ones because if you compare to what they can provide, a very dedicated, hardworking, and very committed people, and plus you're doing something really nice, these are really simple uh, obstacles. So go to the refugee centers where, where your city is and reach out. Um, in our in our side is you know, we're really low on the unemployment. We're we're in the Idaho, for example, is three percent unemployment. We, we you know we're 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 looking for people, uh, and I just said you know upstate New York had the same thing. You know very very low. Um, I think in the states right now, um, the the centers that they settle refugees they're doing an amazing amazing job, an amazing work uh, of of settling, but. Proactively, we could go or they can come, um, but 10, chal 10 pledge is extremely important. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to ask, you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs to come and join this. This is very, very special. Our goal is to get 100 companies on the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul by May. If we do that, this will be such a powerful tool that all the NGOs and organizations, and especially uh, people on the field, will feel so strong. And if we put our minds together, all these great ent entrepreneurs and CEOs, we can make a huge difference. So I'm looking forward to that. So tent.org, please come to tent.org, or call me, or email me, or wherever you are in the world, and I'll come. I'm hoping to bring more companies and entrepreneurs from the region, from Turkey, and from you know, uh, Middle East, because we need to get those voices out here. Um, I would love to see them doing more, and I know they will. Uh, I had a couple of uh, friends that they said they will join. But tent.org, come and join the pledge. And if you're an entrepreneur, you have a great idea, we have a tent uh, challenge. We're going to fund 20 new ideas this year. We're giving, we're giving the seed grants, and I know some of it is going to fail, and that's fine. Uh, so if you have really good ideas, just apply us as through tent.org. And the, the other way that we can do this is, you know, the young, social, active people who create campaigns, who create mindsets. We're asking them to use their creativity to give the message better because we did a study of um, refugees. It's how, how is it seen in 12 different countries? We have it in tent.org, we are sharing with everyone, and what kind of message we can give to people to maybe look at a completely different perspective of how they see the refugees. So that's the deal, tent.org. If you're interested in helping, and you would like to be a part of the experience that he described and solve, you're part of the huge humanitarian challenge that is represented I urge you to get in touch with them. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> we need more companies like this. <laughs>